I'm going to talk about show versus tell in this video, not just what they actually are, but also when you can use them most effectively. I've combed through a few famous books for examples of both showing and telling because famous authors do tell. I've seen them at it. I'll give you some of my tips first and then we'll take a look at those examples. So feel free to move through the video using the chapters in the description. Let's start by talking about showing. This should really be the default aim of your writing. It's what you want to be doing most of the time. Later on, I'm going to tell you how showing can sometimes be bad, but for the most part, we want to stick to it where we can. Showing to me means creating meaning by suggesting and highlighting things to readers in a kind of indirect way. Think of it as leading someone to a beautiful view rather than trying to describe that view to them. For example, this kind of writing would be showing. She thought for a moment of her old honey-scented kitchen, the way the sunlight had fallen across the silent living room. Back then, she would often find her cat, Gerald, asleep in a sunspot in the middle of the rug. She wondered if, hundreds of miles away, that house was still bathed in sunlight as it used to be. What I'm trying to communicate here is that this character misses this old house where presumably she used to live and had some good times. This is showing because it's indirect. I haven't told the reader any of this backstory. I've just illuminated, no pun intended, a few things for the reader to see that might suggest how that character feels without outright stating it. And that's a big part of showing, it's getting your meaning across without being really obvious about it. However, bluntly stating things is not always bad. Sometimes there's information you have to give a reader that can't be highlighted or expanded or dressed up. It just needs to be said. That's where telling comes in. It's often far more brief and always more straightforward. For example, I think telling really shines with lines like this. By the time they got there, he was dead. It's not confusing, it's not open to interpretation, it's clear, it's final, and it's not going back. Telling is great for impact and clarity when there's no room for debate. Sorry, I'm interrupting the main video for a second, but you know, at least it's me and not an ad for Raid Shadow Legends. So if you have a story that you're working on that you wanna to send to journals or to competitions, or if you've just started a novel and you wanna know if you're on the right track, I'm now offering a developmental editing service on my website. I'll take a look at all the obvious stuff, the spelling and grammar, that kind of thing. But I'll also look at how the story works as a whole and how I think you can refine it or develop it. Then I'll give you a complete write up with all of my suggestions and comments and advice. It doesn't matter what level of experience you have, I'll give you some friendly and actionable advice that you can put towards all of your future work as well. There's a QR code on screen and a link in the description if you wanna go and check out prices and that kind of thing. Thank you so much for your patience. Back to the video. Now that we know roughly what showing is and what telling is, let's have a look at when we should use each. Like I said before, we should aim to show as often as we can generally, but I do wanna highlight three key uses. First of all, description. Showing works far better than telling when describing people, places, items, anything. It's more immersive and it's more engaging for readers. The reason I say this is because readers will understand a story through the lens of their own life and their own experiences. They'll use comparison to understand what's being said. That rug in my earlier example would appear to them in the pattern of one that they used to own, or maybe still do. You can tell me the exact pattern of a rug for as long as you want, and I'm still never going to imagine it exactly the way you do. It's hard for you to write and it's hard for me to read. Those details I think are much better shown than told because it will lead to a greater impact in a reader's mind if they can imagine things how they might naturally choose to rather than exactly how you want them to. As wonderful as it might be for us to think up a world exactly as we want it and to beam that image directly into our reader's mind, it's just impossible no matter how good a writer you are. So it makes more sense to help readers imagine it as they want to. To me, that will lead them to enjoy your story more because you're able to make it more relevant to them. And of course, though we're not directly telling them what to imagine, we're still retaining control over that scene. We're still choosing what to illuminate and what to cast light upon. And the next good time to use showing, I think is actually in characterization. I think characters come to life way more for readers when they feel like they're witnessing their strengths and their weaknesses their sense of humour and their flaws rather than just being informed of them. If your character's good at something, I think it's way more impactful for the reader to see them in action rather than just being told that they're better than everybody else. Show us their hands under a magnifier as they work on an intricate circuit board. Don't tell us they're good at fixing computers. And this isn't something that just applies outwardly to your character either. 
you can really show the inner workings of a character's mind just as effectively. We could tell our reader that our character's greatest fear is the sea. Or we could have them remember being tossed overboard from their father's fishing boat and feeling something brush against their leg. Again, it's a case of letting readers discover things rather than directly feeding them information. Readers enjoy it when they feel like they've grown to understand a character, and I don't think just learning a bunch of facts about them is quite the same thing. Finally, another time when showing works really well is when you want to deepen the meaning of your story. Telling readers a child misses his grandfather is one thing. Showing them a little boy sitting quietly holding his grandfather's glasses is another. Often words really fail us and they don't get across the full measure of what it is we're feeling or thinking or experiencing. It's then that showing comes in really handy. Showing the reader experiences and situations that represent the concepts of your story is way more effective than just bluntly stating them. But before you decide that's it, I'm only ever going to show from now on, there are some times when telling is actually better. Let's start with shock and awe. Like my earlier example, I don't think there's a better way of surprising a reader than by telling them outright something unexpected happened without trying to dress it up or smooth it over. There's an element of time to shock, I think. Shock is a quick emotion and telling really replicates that. There's a roughness in delivering an unexpected message through telling that leaves a reader feeling unsettled and a bit shaken up, but in a good way. You can't slap someone in the face slowly, so do it quick. And the next time I think it's good to tell is during pivotal moments in your story. I'm talking about turning points, revelations, plot twists, those moments where the story takes a turn. Those parts of the story are the guidelines of the plot. They have to be clear, they have to be unambiguous, so the reader can't miss them or gloss over them if they're not paying 100% attention. And I think the way to make them clear is to tell them. Think of it like a signpost along the road while you're driving quickly. You don't want to read a paragraph and have to decipher it and understand it and find the meaning in it. You want to look at a short, clear message and know the road ahead of you is about to change. Telling in those moments that alter the course of the story is a great way to say, this part is important. And a few words will land easier than a paragraph might. Then lastly, and kind of similarly, it can be really useful to tell when you're trying to create a hook. This works particularly well at the end of chapters or when you're switching POV from one character to another. I personally like to give readers a little motivation to stick with the story at that point, a little bump in their interest because it's between passages that a reader is most likely to put your book down. I love it when books that I'm reading do this. Life rudely interrupts me and I have to put the book down, but I know I'm coming back to something good because I've just been hooked. And being straightforward about this, I think is the best way to go. Tell them something interesting, expand something you've hinted at before in the course of the story, subvert their expectations, but do so clearly and in simple terms. That's a few points about when we can both show and tell during the course of our writing, but hopefully what it can also do is give you a general idea of how you can apply both techniques in other areas of your writing too. Now let's look at some examples from those famous books. I'll talk about what they both do, show or tell, and why I think that was the correct approach each time. First, I've got an example from one of my favourite books, Station Eleven. He'd known for a long time by then that the world's changes wouldn't be reversed, but still, the realisation cast his memories in a sharper light. The last time I ate an ice cream cone in the park in the sunlight. The last time I danced in a club. The last time I saw a moving bus. The last time I boarded an airplane that hadn't been repurposed as living quarters. An airplane that actually took off. The last time I ate an orange. This is an interesting one because at first glance, it's sort of a list of stuff and you could be forgiven for thinking it's telling, but I don't think it is. Station Eleven is a post-apocalyptic book. It's a book about the loss of the world. And I think what this passage is saying is the world used to be great and now it'll never be that way again. Saying that, I think, would be telling and it wouldn't communicate the same meaning, I don't think, because it's just a definition of a concept rather than an idea of how any of this feels. Instead, what this example does is show by highlighting these things that were once taken for granted, normal things, but now are rare and unobtainable. These items and activities represent the loss of the world. You can't sum up the feeling of, I wish the world wasn't over and expect people to feel anything from that because it's just too big of a concept. We can't really get our heads around how it would feel for civilization to crumble around us 
but what we can maybe understand is how it would feel if we knew we would never eat an ice cream cone in the park again. So if you're trying to say something that's really quite impossible to say, showing is definitely the better option. Here's another passage along similar lines, but this one's from The Road. It has a little bit more emotion in it, but it, it works almost the same way. Years later, he'd stood in the charred ruins of a library where blackened books lay in pools of water, shelves tipped over. Some rage at the lies arranged in the thousands, row on row. He picked up one of the books and thumbed through the heavy bloated pages. He let the book fall and took a last look around and made his way out into the cold grey light. The same as the Station Eleven example, this passage is all about the loss of the world that the character once knew. We're not told he misses the world. We're not told he's given up on ever finding civilization again. We're shown him letting a book fall to the ground. And this particular passage shows us as much about the character as it does his environment. They're both shells of what they used to be, but McCarthy doesn't say the man wished he could have his old life back, or he wishes the world would go back to how it once was. Instead, he shows us the man's last lingering glance at what was once known as a library. This is a useful example of how we can use showing to give an insight into our character's inner mind in exactly the same way that we can use it to give depth to our descriptions. Let's go back to Station Eleven briefly for another example, but this time of how impactful telling can be in the right circumstances. Of all of them there at the bar that night, the bartender was the one who survived the longest. He died three weeks later on the road out of the city. This is clearly a moment of shock and awe within the story. You've got that great setup of who survived the longest and then that twist of expectations when that life expectancy is a mere three weeks. And all of that is told to us in simple facts. I'd go as far as saying it's blunt. The way this is presented makes no attempt to cushion its blow for the reader or to artfully communicate its message. They're dead and that's all there is to say about it. That, I think, is a great example of where it can be so impactful just to tell. If Emily St. John Mandel had chosen to show here instead of telling, then it would have taken way longer. She would have needed to write more description and give more details, and all the while that impact of that shock and awe would have been slowly wearing off because it hadn't been delivered quick enough. Because, of course, one of the main advantages to telling is that it is usually so much quicker and most of the examples are far quicker than that one. Stephen King is an example of this. He often uses short, to the point, straightforward lines to communicate something vital that he doesn't want the reader to miss, those pivotal moments in his stories. Here's an example from The Shining, where Jack, fooling around, is suddenly disturbed. He recognized the similarity himself, and he shook the chain link fence, put a harried expression on his face and whispered, let me out of here, let me out of here. But for the third time, not funny. It was time to get back to work. That was when he heard the sound behind him. The simplicity of the words he uses here serves not to impress us or blow us away with his mastery of language, but instead to hook us. It's telling us the story just changed direction and it's delivering that message quickly, which mimics the speed of Jack whipping round to see what the noise is. If King had decided to describe that sound instead of just telling us it happened, it would have taken longer and diminished that impact again. Not only that, but it would have slowed down the pace. And telling is really, really valuable when it comes to keeping up a fast pace. Shorter, punchier sentences are obviously faster and easier to read, which helps to keep momentum in a story. Take this moment a little bit later with poor Danny. Now somewhere, it was coming for him. It was hiding behind Daddy's face. It was imitating Daddy's voice. It was wearing Daddy's clothes. But it was not his Daddy. It was not his Daddy. Short sentences, no description, just telling as the pace quickens and quickens to a point. And as useful as telling is for speeding up the pace of a story, at those pivotal moments, it can be just as useful in slowing it right down. Take this example, the final lines of a chapter quite near the end. Halloran and Danny and Wendy reached them 15 minutes later. They brought extra clothes and brandy and Dr. Edmonds, and the long darkness was over. Again, short and clear and definite, like turning off the ignition at the end of a long car journey. The ceasing of momentum here is all the better for how quickly it's deployed. It's not a slow ramp down or a gradual fade out like showing might be. This is collapsing on the doorstep, having finally made it. Before I recap some of those important points, I want to just say you might have heard some of those examples and thought, I'm not sure that's telling or I'm not sure that's showing. Absolutely. And while there's clear differences between the two, 
Like anything else in writing, showing and telling isn't simply a binary choice of one or the other. There's a spectrum, and it all depends on the style and the type of the story and the time and the place. What those examples are, I hope, is a suggestion of how and when you can use showing and telling, not a rule book. It's important for you to find a balance that you're comfortable with, and a lot of that just comes with time and practice. Let's recap. Showing and telling both have their distinct advantages. Showing works best, in my opinion, for stuff like description, characterization, and deepening meaning. And in the majority of fiction writing, it should be what you want to do most of the time. It generally complements a slower paced scene and is most useful, I think, when trying to communicate something abstract to a reader. It generally helps to remember this. If you can't explain it like a beautiful view, then try and show it instead. Telling, on the other hand, is best for emphasis, shock and awe, turning points and hooks in your story. It's great for quickening the pace of a story or killing it dead. And I think it's best used for things that aren't open to debate, like a sudden twist or a shocking death. Something to bear in mind is that telling works best in moderation, so save it for those really pivotal moments and it'll carry the most impact. Try pulling your readers in by showing, and then flattening them with a tell. Showing and telling is something that I get asked about fairly often, and this channel is all about helping you to write more immersive and more meaningful stories of all kinds. So if you're working on a story right now, I really hope this has helped. If you're making improvements and you're building your skills in writing, don't miss this video pointing out a few common errors that might be sneaking into your stories. Thank you so much for watching as always, and happy writing.